current athletes listening that are looking at, at yeah, completing their degree and, and doing the same thing you did, transitioning to high-performance sport? What would yep. be some tips you, you wish you heard? Yep. Certainly working in the rehab space, the one thing you learn very quickly is that, you know, that there's, there's absolutely no shortcuts um, that you can take and there should never be a cookie cutter approach taken when formulating a successful rehab program. You know, no injury or athlete's characteristics are the same. So, you know, all athletes have different personalities, lifestyle factors, post-injury goals, degrees of, of competitiveness. And the other piece of advice I, I'd probably give myself coming into it, always have plan A, B, and, and sometimes C going into your day's planning. You could have formulated the best session for an athlete amongst, you know, five or six others. But if one or two of them come into training or pulled up sore or one or two of them, you know, at home because they're sick, it could throw your conditioning or, you know, some of the footy drills that you had planned out due to numbers changing. So I think it's always important to have a backup plan and, and be flexible. Either shoulder or sort of knee injury. Yeah. Talk us through the sort of key blocks that you, that you like to take the athlete through? We usually start with the recovery stage, you know, where, where a lot of information's gathered, what's happened, you know, exactly what we're dealing with. Essentially, we're, we're trying to get them back to baseline with their symptoms and, and clinical signs as quickly as possible. And then once they're through those earlier stages, yeah, the next stage we'll, we'll move to the reloading stage. And during this stage, we're aiming to get them back to, to basic functional movements and, and starting to load the tissue again in the gym and, and hopefully out in the field. Once a lot of our strength criteria numbers are, are tracking in the right direction and, and the athletes recovering well from the previous stimulus, then we'll start to transfer our mindset from the reloading stage to the reconditioning stage. Once they've graduated this stage, the, the medical team essentially hand the full reins over to me and I go to work with the athlete and aim to condition them back to full function and peak performance as best I can. And when managing either challenging players that are really pushing to come back in a faster time frame than perhaps you've presented to them or, or there's some external pressure for, from the coaches, you know, let's say it's a big game to, to make finals. How do you sort of balance the, the pressure and obviously then also the duty of care? I, I think it's a very fine balance. You have to be willing to, to push the limits with your players when they're reconditioning. I don't think you can afford to be conservative and, and bring them back unfit and underdone because, you know, just because you wanted to avoid, you know, re-injury because their, their performance will suffer and the player will be no good to the team anyway. So <laughs> they may as well still be out. So that's why we use progression criteria. That's why we do strength and power testing to give us that confidence and belief in our program. And that's why I said, you know, daily monitoring is, is extremely important as well. So you, you know how they're tracking day to day. And your experience since then that uh, the most effective when perhaps you do see a, a, a lazy action or, or a behavior that you think isn't congruent with, with what that athlete necessarily yeah. should do. What's your, what's your approach? Yeah, it's funny. I, I often think of Bill in those situations. The thing that I always remember with him and I, you know, Training under him was was brutal, but he would be up front and let you know exactly what you're in for. And he would always say, I make no apologies to you guys that this is going to be, you know, extremely hard. He'd almost be telling us that, you know, prepare to be absolutely flogged and, and feel crook during it. I think if you can explain to the athlete what benefits they're, they're going to get out of it, they'll get it done eventually. A lot of guys... We'll just eat it up and absolutely love it. But there is always a small percentage of guys who drag the chain along. You do have to give a little bit more love to them as well. And, you know, just to spend a, a bit more time with them, you know, pushing them along, and being by their side. In an AFL environment, in your work life, what are your sort of pet peeves? Yeah, probably my pet peeve would definitely be lazy athletes and athletes that conditional and, and pick and choose whether they train hard, you know, today or not. You'll never get a better job than being a professional athlete, in my opinion. And as, as I mentioned earlier, some athletes are, are wired differently and, and, you know, some fell into professional sport, you know, because they got lucky with what God gave them at birth. My belief is that, you know, if you're going to sign a, a big contract and, and take a big pay packet and, and all the big, 
you know, all the bells and whistles that, that come along with it. You know, you, you better show up every day and get after it. There's some people that would give absolutely anything to be in their privileged position. 